Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking about the hidden costs of the digital world. Technology companies are some of the largest companies in the world and all of us are consuming more devices and more data all the time. But behind this cloud-based world is an enormous infrastructure that consumes huge amounts of material as well as energy. And as technology advances with the likes of 5G and AI, that consumption is set to go up in an order of magnitude. Our guest is Guillaume Pitron. Guillaume is the author of The Dark Cloud, The Hidden Costs of the Digital World. He's an award-winning journalist and documentary maker for some of France's leading television channels, and we previously had him on on episode 67 to talk about his last book, The Rare Metals War. Guillaume's book traces emails and social media likes from the dematerialized world of the cloud into the reality of the material world on our planet. As always, you can really support the show by telling a colleague or leaving a positive review on the platform you're listening on. And I hope you enjoyed the episode. Guillaume, welcome back to the show. Thank you for inviting me again. So we last had you on, I've just checked, it was episode 67 back in 2021 to discuss your book, The The Rare Metals War, and I encourage listeners to go back and listen to that. This is in some ways uh, a bit of a sequel to that. It's called The Dark Cloud, and it's just been released in English in the last couple of weeks, and I'll put links in the show notes to it. But this is essentially the story of digital pollution and how much new technologies, new devices are driving energy consumption as well as material consumption and the impacts of that. And in, and in many ways, how this is somewhat of a blind spot in our personal lives as well as in, in, in legislation and oversight. So I guess to set the scene, can you, I just find it fascinating in the book, how you, you talk about tracing the like. Can you just set the scene for us? You know, two people sat together, one liking another one's Instagram post and the journey that like takes. Yeah. Well, Paul, if I am sitting next to uh, someone in an office and I want to send to send to such a person an email, my first assumption would be to say that the distance the email will travel will be probably a couple of meters. And in fact, the real distance between me and this person from my phone to this person's phone is actually several thousands of kilometers. Because the email or the like or whatever kind of thing you want to send to this person will actually reach a 4G antenna on the top of the the building where you are. And then uh, the signal will be transformed into pulsations of lights in the fiber optic cable that will go down the building under the sidewalk of the street where your building is. And then it will reach other likes and emails into uh, a data center, travel uh, until the coast of my country, uh, where I am right now, which is France, the Atlantic coast. And the like will go through a submarine fiber optic cable through the Atlantic Ocean until the United States, because my like has been probably produced on an American social network. It will once again be stored into data centers on the U.S. eastern coast or western coast and travel back at the speed of light, almost the speed of light, 200,000 kilometers a second through the Atlantic Ocean again and arrive on my uh, neighbor's phone. And that will take not more than a second because everything goes so fast and we don't have a feeling of such a distance, but this is a distance. And the question is, so there is an infrastructure, that there is a digital infrastructure. And what, what about this infra? And nobody has talked about it. Nobody knows about uh, where it is, what it looks like. If you can smell it, touch it, taste it, listen to it. That's what I've done for two years. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the book is your journey of discovering that trace that the the light takes and the digital pollution and consumption that comes around it which is in two forms really one is the material side and one is the energy side exactly can you just but to set the scene the amount of energy currently and well let's stay on the energy side for a second but the amount of energy at the moment that is consumed by this digital infrastructure is enormous and set only to get exponentially bigger First, we need energy for extracting and refining the metals that we end up in our phones, servers, and cables. 
that are part of our daily connected lives. But we'll get back to the material side. But there is energy here. And then there is also energy needed for running the data centers, which are a keystone part of the infrastructure. Uh, data centers are all around us. We need them for, uh, you know, storing the data, uh, calculating the data. There are 3 million data centers in the world for running internet. And these data centers have to work 24-7. There cannot be any uh, breakdown. It's just not possible. Otherwise, there's no internet at all. So if you want to run this infrastructure 24-7 without any interruption, you also need electricity. If we make the calculation, the total amount of all this electricity, which is being needed for running the digital world in general, that amounts to, on average, 10% of the world consumption of electricity, 10%. So that's a quite fair amount of electricity, which is being needed for our connected lives. And because we're consuming so much of these devices, because our growth of consumption is exponential, that 10% figure may actually become 20% by the next 10 or 15 years, if you don't take that issue into consideration anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. And again, this comes, you know, the, one of the overarching themes of the book is this idea of that being a blind spot, or at least certainly recognized by those in the industry, but many, many layers by the fangs to try and conceal and hide that energy footprint. But, and in and, and, and some sense, all of us as well, right? I mean, we don't think that it, you know, that Zoom call we just had, the reality of how much energy it just consumed, you know, I think you and I discussed about the idea of being about two, driving two miles. You know, these are incredibly thirsty digital technologies that we're using, and those are expanding, and that's the story we're going to tell. But let's start with the material side before we move on to the the energy piece. You talk a lot in the book about this concept of MIPS, M-I-P-S. Can you, can you start us off there and give us some sense of the scale of how much material many of these devices, our laptops, our phones, etc., consume? Well, today in the world, there are about 34 billion devices running and working. When I talk about devices, I talk about phones, tablets, computers, 34 billion. And all these uh, uh, devices are made of metals, a lot of metals, uh, like probably 50, 60, 70 metals on average in a phone, in a smartphone. And uh, to extract uh, the metals from the ground, to refine them, uh, you need water in order to refine such metals. You need electricity and energy in order to turn the resource into the metal. And you need to move all the components all around the world using you know, planes, and these planes consume oil. So basically, if you make the calculation of the total amounts of resources that are directly and indirectly featured into the very finished product, which is your phone, you end up with, with what you call a MIPS, a Material Input Per Service Unit, which is a ratio between the final way of the product and all the resources that have been needed to make such a product possible. And the ratio, such a ratio, you can make it for every product around you. You can make it for a pen, you can make it for a shirt, you can make it for a book. And this ratio may be 100 to 1, 200 to 1, 300 to 1, but you can also make it for a phone. And this ratio goes up to 1,200 to 1. And the highest ratio possible has been calculated for the microchip of your phone, which is 16,000 for 1. So you need 16,000 times more resources than the, final, than the final way of the product. If a ship uh, weighs 2 grams, you need 32 kilograms of resources. And if your phone weighs like 150 grams, you need up to 180 grams, uh, kilograms of resources to make your phone possible. So that's a very interesting uh, ratio, this MIPS, because when you look at it, you realize that the lighter it is in your pocket, the heavier it is. And the more discreet it is, the more obvious the consequences on the environment can be at the other end of the world where these uh, products start uh, come to existence, which is in a mine. And that tells us something which is very interesting, Paul. It is that not only turning virtual comes at a material cost, but maybe the more we turn virtual, the more we materialize. Because the ratio of our electronic devices is the highest of every product we have ever produced in the course of the human history. So I have a question here. By turning virtual, 
aren't we actually materializing even more? Yes, exactly. And it's that sort of illusion of a dematerialized world that, you know, I guess is quite profound in our in our societies where, you know, someone involved in mining is far more deleterious to the, the planet than someone in, in working for a tech company. But actually, <laughs> both are equally as impactful, right? At least, at least the working in the mine has a consciousness of that. He knows about it. Yeah. Not the guy in a startup running a, a startup company has no idea about the true impact of what he does at the other end of the world because it's just far away and it's yeah. invisible. And that happens at the society level as well, right? All of us can feel great about just being online and virtual, but actually the the impacts are are, are hidden and they you know this illusion of a dematerialized world. But one of the so and I'm going to just draw bits out of the book that I found completely fascinating. One of the consequences of of this material impact is also um, felt in the fact that you've got faster rate, faster rates of redundancy in the devices that we have, right? And those devices aren't meant to be fixed in any way. A lot of them are just all glued together. There's very little ability to fix these devices, but you also have the proliferation of smart tech into, and you're talking about these smart cities and so forth, into all of these everyday objects, which is actually increasing the rate of obsolescence and therefore putting even more burden on the material requirements uh, to create these products. Can you talk about that piece as well? Yeah, about obsolescence. Uh, there are several types of obsolescence. The first one is like a technical one. Uh, basically, the battery of your phone is down and you could just change the battery and replace the battery. The thing is, the battery is glued to your phone, and because you can't uh, take it out, uh, basically you have to change the entire device, which by the way were perfectly functional instead of the battery. There is another obsolescence, which is very interesting. This is a software obsolescence. You have an old phone, you want to download the latest app, the latest version of an app, and the phone tells you it's not possible to download the latest app because this is incompatible. And the latest obsolescence, uh, which is also known, this is a cultural obsolescence. Uh, you have about one year ago an iPhone 14. It's very good, very well functional, but the iPhone 15 has just been released and it has a better memory, a better battery capacity. It's just more beautiful. And you're going to uh, to 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 buy this new phone, even if the, the 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 former one works very well, and that accelerates, as you said, the rate of consumption of all these devices. And we could certainly, you know, keep our phones for three, four, five, six, seven years uh, by repairing them and just by getting used to them and getting used to the late the, the oldest technology. But we want to be, uh, you know, we want to go faster. We want to. We want to live in our times, we want to be modern, and we are just buying the next phone. And that comes at a huge material impact, uh, which certainly stands for the biggest impact of the digital world. Mm. Most of the ecological impact of digital pollution is first a material impact. The impact of manufacturing phones, tablets, computers, changing servers in data centers. Uh, servers could run for many, many years, but at some point there are some cybersecurity issues or efficiency issues, and we prefer changing the servers, even if they're perfectly functional. You know, we love changing. We love uh, buying new dresses, uh, clothes, and the same way we like, uh, we like changing our electronic devices, and that comes at a huge cost. Yeah, and the story is those devices are so much more impactful in terms of consumption than changing your T-shirt. And there's also this other fascinating phenomenon now as well where your fridge might be perfectly good, but because the, the Internet of Things object in it has failed, the whole fridge is now also obsolescent as well. So it's not just the technology itself, it's, it's the, what it's attached to also gets scrapped. The book also spends some time talking about kind of the mirage of the, the circular economy. and. I'd love to get your thoughts on that, but also part of the challenge as well is there's sort of some of these hidden chemicals, like these fluorinated gases that are so crucial to chip manufacturing that have an absolutely enormous greenhouse gas effect and are these permanent chemicals that stay there forever, right? I mean, this is there's, mm. there's lots in the processes of these devices that have a profound mm. effect as well. Mm. What I've tried to do in the book is to unveil what's invisible. And what's invisible is uh, MIPS, as I mentioned, because it's, it's mining somewhere else far away uh, from where you, uh, you buy your phone. The second hidden invisible effect is nanotechnology, 
the cost of producing nanotechnology, which which actually makes it possible to to run and to manufacture powerful microchips. And we have no idea about the high cost of the nano world. And the third cost, as you mentioned, is F gases. These gases are very much necessary for climatization. And we use this uh, non-natural gas. They are being uh, produced out of human brain. These gases are necessary for, you know, air conditioning in your car, in your in your apartment, but also in data centers. And a part of these gases are used for the digital world. And the thing is, their uh, heating power is way more important than the uh, than the heating power of CO two. And for not, for some of these gases, actually, is uh, uh, the heating power of such gases maybe 100, 200, 300, 400 times more than CO2. And they just don't disappear easily because they are non-natural gases. They are coming out of laboratories. Uh, and basically, it's very... Uh, first, we have no idea about it. Uh, and second, we are doing our best today to get rid of these gases and to find alternatives which are more natural, more compatible with the limits of the Earth. But in the meantime, we're using them, and uh, it's uh, it's a climatic bomb. Yeah, and and not due to be phased out till I think twenty twenty five, even in Europe, right? I mean these these things are being consumed at ever ever higher rate right now. The other sort of talking about uncovering the hidden. There's a lot of time focused on on these fiber optic cables under the sea, and also the the sheer scale of infrastructure around these data centers. Can you, we're going to come back to cables and kind of they have an interesting geopolitical story, but can you just give us some sense of where these data centers are, how large they are, how the, the duplication as different companies want their own control? I mean, you talk in the book about how uh, the NSA here in the United States has, I think, the world third largest data center. And these things are A, enormous, and B, consume incredible amount of materials to keep them running and you know, and often hidden in out of the way places under inconspicuous company names because you know the the fangs of the world don't want to be associated with them. But yeah, can we just focus on data centers for a bit? I'll try to make the long story short. But basically, you and I we use every day each of us one hundred data centers a day. That seems like a crazy figure, but this is um, um, a true figure. Um, for an email that I'm sending to someone, I use probably six or seven data centers if I send uh, such an email on Gmail. Why? Because my email is replicated in all these data centers around the world. So that wherever I am around the world, if I want to get an access to my Gmail account, the page of my Gmail account is downloading faster because I am close or closer to one of these data centers. So if I'm in South America, I may connect to one data center in South America where my Gmail account actually is. And if I'm in Europe, I may connect to a data center which is closer to where I am in Paris, so probably on the European continent. So for avoiding latency, for for shortening the time of downloading the page of your email, we need to replicate the data in several places of the world so you can, once again, get closer and closer to uh, where your email is stored, physically speaking, in a server of a data center. The other thing is, Paul, um, you don't want to be connecting on your Gmail account and have uh, Gmail saying, oh, sorry, we're down. Come back tomorrow. This is not possible. You want to have an access to your Gmail account 24-7. And to make sure that that happens, uh, basically, the uh, Google replicates the data center so that if there's one data center going down because there may be like an electricity uh, breakdown where there's another mirror data center just running at the same time so that actually it replicates the data and makes sure that you will always have an instant access to whatever device uh, whatever service you want so this you know goal of latency of of making latency disappearing and the other goal of guaranteeing to the consumer what the industry calls the continuity of service means that you have to oversize the infrastructure. You have to make sure that there is more than needed, but just in case something breaks down. And that leads us to the figure that I mentioned before, 3 million data centers around the world, much more than what we need, but we just want to make sure that nothing wrong happens. And if you wake up at 3 a.m. in the night and you want to get an access to your email, you'll get an access to your email because of these data centers. 
these data centers consume electricity. 30% to 50% of the electricity consumed by a data center is being used for refreshing the servers, thanks to air conditioning systems. And that electricity may be produced out of a coal power plant or a, a wind farm or a nuclear power plant, but you always have to go back to the source of the electricity to get a sense of the CO2 impacts and other impacts of such an infrastructure. Here comes the NSA, which is a fascinating story because the NSA, I think it was back in 2011 or 12, built in Bluffdale, Utah, the second driest state of the United States, one of its biggest data center. I think at the time it was the biggest data center of the National Security Agency. And the data center, obviously, to refresh the data, would use some water from the Jordan River, which was flowing through Bluffdale. So the question was, how much water does uh, the Bluffdale NSA data center consume? And, uh, you know, that was uh, like a question which was being raised by local media, uh, worried about the ecological impact of it. Eventually, there was no such story about it, but came an NGO whose name is the Tense Amendment Center. This is a U.S. NGO, and this NGO was very much against all this surveillance program that was just unveiled by Snowden. And they said, basically, maybe the state of Utah has the right, according to the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, to just stop the water, to just cut the water off the NSA. And if we can legally challenge the federal states by saying that we in Utah have the right to decide of who we are providing water to, well, maybe we stop all this surveillance thing. <laughs> and that seems like a crazy story, <laughs> but they legally tried to cut off water to the NSA, thinking that if there was no water, there would be no surveillance. I don't say what's next, but on the, the very basic assumption is that whatever kind of prometheum and the Avor, with such a surveillance program, which is PRISM, you want, you, you, you want to engage at the worldwide scale. Everything, first and foremost, depends on water. And uh, we'll leave people to read the book to see what happens next. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe and the Americas and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. Moving over, I guess, to the energy side. Another fascinating, this is sort of this story of kind of almost to some extent thoughtless sort of exponential growth in the amount of data that we are collecting. And this starts with kind of bloatware, this idea that sort of a website today has, because of cookies, because of the data it collects, that probably goes unused, but websites now are so much more data consumptive than they were even five years ago. Can you talk to that a little bit and the energy impact there, and then we'll move on to 5G and how that sort of put this whole thing on steroids? Sure. The thing, Paul, is we are witnessing, experiencing two dynamics. And the first dynamic, I'll be very short here, is a dynamic that says, well, we are well aware within the industry, within the fangs of such an impact and the energy consumption of it. But we're working hard on mitigating such an impact. And we are producing new servers, we are substituting resources by others, and we are even moving the cloud to the coldest place on Earth. And I have an example here of uh, Facebook in 2013, moving one of its data centers for European and African consumers in the north of Lapland, 100 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle, where the cold is free, where there is free cooling, so that they would use less electricity for refreshing the data centers because electricity, because the freshness is naturally in the air. So that's a way of mitigating the impact of the cloud. And that's a good news, by the way. The other dynamic, and that relates to your question, is that the more I have the feeling that whatever I do on the web, it will have less impact. And the more I believe that everything is invisible, and the more I believe that everything is free, well, basically, the more I consume such a data. And uh, uh, this is what exactly what's happening. Uh, you know, think about the number of text messages you had the right to send when you got your first smartphone or phone 20 years ago. 
you had the right to send maybe 50 text message a month for what you had paid. Today, I, I can send 50 messages every hour if I want. And this is what we call a rebound effect. The more I am used to using these devices, the more I use them. And the more I diversify such usages by uh, watching videos on Netflix, uh, by uh, developing AIs, whatever kind of AIs, by making a research on ChatGPT, even for wondering what I'm going to eat for the evening. You know, all these new ways of using the data are actually coming in contradiction with the impacts of technologies for mitigating my web impact. So on the one hand, there's something better. And on the other hand, I consume more. And the thing is, the mitigation doesn't go as fast as the exponential growth of all the data that I use every day, because I'm fascinated by such an industry, which that is internet. Well, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because again, as 5G spreads, as you talk about in the book, yeah, we're just consuming more. So there's, and the mitigation is never going to, never going to catch up. I don't think so. And there is one reason why, Paul. It's because data is power, data is knowledge, data is money, data is your new oil. We all know that. Everyone wants to get more data and everyone wants to get, you know, the best algorithm in order to turn the data into knowledge. And Putin said that uh, if he could uh, acquire quantum technology, he would be the first uh, most powerful nation of the 21st century. So everyone rushing that direction. So every positive and, and optimistic message saying, oh, don't worry, we're going to replace one metal by one another. We're going to do circular economy and recycle. Oh, we're going to use less electricity per data store because they have a new amazing technology. These messages are true, but they can't actually compensate for our uh, thirst of power, knowledge, and money. That is what men are the best at doing. And they've been the best at doing this for, for, for centuries and, and, and millenniums. And this is where we are. And that's why I don't believe in a single second that we're heading towards a society where we're going to, to have a lesser impact on the environment by using these devices. This impact will just grow bigger. Mm. And, and and really, the, the latest story in this year is AI, which is orders of magnitude more consumptive of that data, which is, again, that feedback loop where more and more data is being constantly captured of any transaction interaction on the web, uh, in our devices at home, the Internet of Things and so forth. And it's recognized by the fangs, you know, the, <clears throat> the large companies, the tech companies, they want to collect this data, even though they can't do anything with it right now. But AI is, you know, is also incredibly more consumptive on the energy side. So cometh AI and chat GPT, a lot of this scale is going to be lifted by an order of magnitude. It will. And it's absolutely certain that this will come at a higher cost. I also want to insist upon something, Paul, uh, we haven't touched upon that, but AI can be also a good thing for the environment. AI algorithms may also come to support uh, data center companies in order to uh, mitigate their environmental impact. That is also true. Uh, uh, you know, there is not only a bad side of it, there can be a good side. If I had traveled to the United States uh, to make that interview, obviously my CO2 footprint uh, for such an interview would have been way higher than you and I speaking on the web. Uh, but once again, uh, we're getting back to it. Um, AI is just a fascinating technology. We're all fascinated by that. We're fascinated by 5G and we don't even know what really we're going to do out of 5G. When you ask companies still today, but what are you going to do out of it? They can give you, you know, large and vague answers. Oh, that's going to be good for the Internet of Things. So that's going to be good for uh, whatever, you know, uh, uh, getting to know better uh, every part of a, of a plane and being able to change, uh, to replace in advance a, a specific part of that plane, which doesn't work because I have the information that that specific part is actually about to collapse. Uh, all these messages are very interesting. The very true thing is we don't even really know what we're going to do out of 5G. What we know is that we won't, don't want the Chinese to go faster than us. And with the French, we don't want the Americans to go faster than us. So we're developing 5G devices everywhere with our own technology because of geopolitical sovereignty technological sovereignty because of growth, because we don't want to be lagging behind in the race for who's going to be the next superpower of the 21st century. So it all relates to power and competition. But don't talk to me about environment here. Mm. Yeah, and I want to come back to the geopolitics because the couple of chapters at the end of the book are really about that and, and undersea cables. But before we get there, just 
you know, it, it what's sort of fascinating again and, and really comes out of the book is how unaware, you know, I am, I think people in general are, of the environmental impact of the cloud, right? And how actually it is deeply, of course it is, deeply rooted in the material world and indeed uh, far more so than many other industries. What and how has that perception been maintained and you know is there is there a growing understanding through books like this that actually that's not the case because again there's this sort of sense that if you're you know in silicon valley that's a far better for the world career than it is working in in the energy world for example i think there are many reasons for that certainly there have been some studies being made even by un agencies over the past 20 years linking digitalization to uh, dematerialization and linking dematerialization to a lesser impact of human activities on the earth. And that has been uh, supported by figures. And I discuss in the book uh, the, the origin of the figures, which company used such figures, for what purpose, and I even question the reliability of all these studies. But I would probably try to concentrate my answer on one single object, which is an iPhone. An iPhone, Paul, is a beautiful object. This is a, a marvelously beautiful object. And Steve Jobs, when he headed uh, the production of the first iPhone, said to his engineers, I want an iPhone to look like a Japanese Buddhist temple. Steve Jobs was not Buddhist, but he said repeatedly that uh, aesthetics of Zen Buddhism from Japan was a perfection. He liked these Buddhist temples with Aetherian virgin lines uh, that looked like something really pure. And he wanted the iPhone, the first iPhone, to look like such a Buddhist temple, simple to use, with a very simple aesthetic. And we end up today with having in this, in our end, such beautiful devices. And how do you want to believe any second that the internet infrastructure may be dirty when you have within your hands something which is so beautiful as an iPhone. The only physical perception that you're going to have of the internet for your entire life will be your phone. You won't see anything about the cables. You won't see anything about the data centers. You won't look at the rocket uh, sending space satellites for, for space internet in the, uh, in the upper atmosphere. We won't see any of those. The only physical link that I will have with internet will be my phone and it will be a beautiful object. And once again, with such a perception in mind that internet is beautiful, how do you want to believe a single second that it can be dirty at the same time? And that's, I think, all the ambiguity about this internet stuff being positive for the environment, whereas it's not, stems from this physical perception that I have by just holding an iPhone or whatever kind of other smartphone was in my hand. Yeah, and but there's also been very true, right? Um, there's also been significant lobbying efforts, of course, and there's also been a, a distancing by the technology companies in both sort of distance, physical distance from their data centers, right? They're hidden out the way, but also under different company names. There's, you know, there's a there is a, a a wholesale effort to maintain that illusion of a dematerialized world. Yeah, that's what I discovered when I traveled to Sweden, where once again, Facebook established one or several data centers 10 years ago. I realized that, you know, today, I mean, when I went there, and that was a couple of years ago, but nobody was talking anymore about such a data center. And I went to visit the data center, not from the inside, I had no right, but at least from the outside. And my first perception that it was a boring place. It was like a blue or light blue data centers, the same color of the sky. Some parts of the data centers were white, like the color of the snow all around. The flags with the Facebook uh, brand were very small. In a way, Facebook was getting invisible and invisibilized. And even legally speaking, in the, in the legal documents mentioning the presence of Facebook in Sweden, Facebook was not being mentioned as Facebook. It was being mentioned as a branch company. Was them I, I just forgot as I speak to you now. But Facebook basically is everywhere on your screens, but it's nowhere in the physical world or in administrative documents, literally named Facebook when you're in Sweden. And I realized that that wasn't only Facebook doing this, but Amazon, uh, you know, the data centers for, for Amazon web service are not named Amazon. 
They are named uh, Vandalay industry in the United States. So there is like a distance being taken between the company and the infrastructure. And I discovered that Apple had been building in the United States a couple of years ago data center, which was invisibilized from the Google Map devices until the moment the data center would, would, would start running. So no one would have an idea about how big was such a thing until it would start to run, but because it was just erased from Google Maps. So it's not only that the infrastructure is far away from where you, where you are, or it's, it's in suburbs or in the middle of a desert in Utah, but the thing is, it's invisibilized. I discovered such a strategy by the Fang where if you don't want to be attacked, just become untouchable, physically speaking, literally speaking. How do you want to criticize something which has no physical existence? And this is where we are here with this infra. Once again, Facebook, Amazon, Google are everywhere on the web. But where are they in the real world beside the headquarters in California? They are nowhere. So how do you want to, how do you want to touch them mm. if they're untouchable? Yeah, fascinating. And, and then one final a couple of final bits to this story, but I do want to talk about this sort of digital sovereignty, the geopolitical competition, and the proliferation of these undersea fiber optic cables as part of, even with China's case, as a, a digital silk road. Can you just give us some sense of the proliferation there and, and kind of what's going on? And in a sense, um, you know, a, a deglobalizing world is creating the need for more and more duplicates in terms of infrastructure because of that lack of trust and because of that geopolitical competition, as you described. Yes, this is a fascinating story too. Uh, basically, we keep thinking that whenever we send an email, this email goes in the air. It may probably go into a satellite and then go down uh, the other way around through satellites, but actually it's just not true. And as I speak to you now, 99% of the data we exchange is being exchanged through fiber optic cables. Why? It's because the breadth width of such devices it's much, is much better than any other satellite technology. And now someone comes to me and say, oh, uh, do you need a wireless device? Uh, what about installing wireless internet in your apartment? But nothing is wireless. And we have never been, Paul, as, as much uh, you know, linked each other by wires than what we are today because there are as i speak to you now 500 about 500 cables uh, crossing the world under the seas to link continents they are being laid into the seas because it's much cheaper to lay a cable into the seas and uh, laying them on on the ground on on the emerged grounds and if i make the total amount of all the kilometers miles of such uh, cables that would amount to 1.2 million kilometers. So if I had to translate that into American metrics, I would say probably 800,000 miles of cables. That makes 30 times the circumference of the Earth. And um, you, can, you can watch the cables because they're under the sea. You don't know that they do exist, but actually I was able to assist to experience the laying of one of these cables between France and the United States. It was a goggle cable crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And I could see the, the workers literally laying the data center, uh, the, the cable on, on, the French, or on the French shores. That was very fascinating. And here comes geopolitics, uh, because when you talk about such infrastructure, you talk about, uh, these are fragile uh, cables. They can be cut, they can be probably spied, and you want to protect them in case of wars. And so there is a geopolitics behind a single like. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's part of that story of the fact that how material this world is, and therefore the fragility of yes it precisely one of the we all know it from events in in ukraine that you know there was a deep worry very early on in that invasion that russia was going to cut various of these cables and it would have a devastating impact so you know and that will also play out yeah. in god forbid in taiwan etc which didn't happen by the way there were some cables which were being cut and we don't know for what reason 
but uh, there was no, you know, like massive uh, attack by the Russians on the cables. Um, and you ask me as a question, and I'm trying to answer such a question. China starts owning its own cables. They want to have their own cable sovereignty. So they want to manufacture the cables. Uh, they want to man they want to have their own uh, boats uh, for laying the cables into the sea. They, they want to have their own digital Silk Road, and they're developing, deploying their own cabled digital Silk Road around the world. And that's certainly uh, something that Xi Jinping really much looks forward to have, is to have China less and less dependent upon U.S. cables, for example. But that's going to be, that's going to be a hard task because, uh, you know, being one single country and being able to actually deploy worldwide an alternative network that would spread uh, between China and all the other 190 countries around the world is, is a difficult task. But obviously, China is really aware of uh, its lack of sovereignty over this infrastructure. And uh, this is also a subject that Europe is, uh, you know, very much caring about. And also the United States, uh, you know, they, they don't want, you guys don't want in the United States to have Chinese cables being plugged on the e US territory. Uh, and whenever there is a Chinese owned cable being potentially plugged, uh, the administration, uh, whether it's uh, usually Trump administration, but certainly Biden administration refuses such a possibility because of the risks of uh, data uh, data spying and data leakage from the United States to China. So here comes sovereignty, obviously, yes. Yeah, and we recently had um, Chris Miller on the show talking about his book Chip War, and it's that same, you know, how central semiconductors are to, the, to this story and also to geopolitics. Before we let you go, you know, it, it is it is a fascinating piece of journalism and 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 the story. It's also obviously quite quite, quite depressing as well. Um, do you have any sense of kind of the of solutions or sort of at least awareness and and right now in in governments in society about this this impact and and sort of the, just the the future ahead of us which is one of exponential energy and material consumption as all of these devices mm. now with 5g consume more data and consume more energy you know where where where's the story left off and do you see any sort of positive rays of hope well, first, I'm not pessimistic. I'm realistic, but uh, I tend not to be pessimistic at all. This uh, subject matter is, is gaining ground. The understanding of it is gaining ground. I wouldn't say that the United States are leading in such an awareness, uh, but probably more um, Northern Europe countries, such as Sweden, for example, but also Germany, France. Uh, I'm not saying this because I'm French, but France was the first country two years ago to pass on a law uh, which was specifically targeting digital pollution. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. The first thing to do is to be aware of it. Um, whatever way you can be aware of it, reading a book, or listening to a podcast, uh, watching a documentary on, on, on the internet <laughs> in order to, under to understand its impact, but also keeping your phone. Once again, uh, material pollution accounts for most of the digital pollution. And pollution due to the manufacturing of devices probably stands for 70% of such a pollution. So if you don't change your phone every 18 months, if you <laughs> keep your phone every for, for three years or more, uh, I've been keeping my, my second-hand phone for three years, for now, it's an iPhone 7. Well, it has a big impact if it can be multiplied by the billions of users of such devices. Obviously, bigger questions are coming here, Paul. What about the data? We can produce more data and having a lesser impact for each byte of data that we produce, but still we're going to produce more and more and more data. And the taboo question which comes here is, what is the real use we do of this, out of this data? What is the cost-benefit analysis we can do out of this data? Do I need to produce such a data, given the fact that I'm just not going to do anything out of it? Here comes a question. What about Brentways for a connected hospital versus Brentways for videos on TikTok? If I had to choose to prioritize data into a cable, what would be my priority? If I ask such a question to people out of the hospital, I will know what, what, what is their answer. But if I ask the same question out of a college and I ask to teenagers, what do you think? I will know the answer. It will be a different answer. And they will say, but during COVID-19, I need TikTok to be uh, close to my friends and to keep having a social life. So, but this question of prioritization of the data, 
how do we prioritize such an infrastructure, the, the materials that, we, that, are needed for that, for, that are needed for that, the energy that is needed for that? It's, it's a political question that brings to the table a collective discussion we have never had on how do we do better, but with actually less data, because I don't think... Uh, the cost-benefit analysis of such an industry has ever been seriously done. Yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, there are some things on the horizon, such as, you know, scope three carbon emissions that are going to yeah. bring some of this visibility to some of this stuff. And yeah. there's also, ultim- ultimately at the moment, we aren't really paying for our data to be stored, right? Um, and, this is uh, free. This is the nature of the internet, right? We, yeah. we are the product. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, there, and you can probably, see more. Yeah. It's like an open buffet. You know, you never leave an open buffet without having eaten too much. Yeah. And it's an illusion of, of, of having such a free service as you as you as you seem to say, because you pay. But in return you pay with parts of yourself, which we call the data. But if I decide tomorrow, sorry for having interrupted you, but if we decide tomorrow that we're going to change the business model of the internet <laughs> and we're going to pay for a Facebook account and we're going to pay for an email and we're going to pay for uh, you know, uh, downloading an, uh, another Netflix series in addition to the 100 Netflix series that I've already downloaded this month. Well, if we decide that, if we put back in the choice the question of the cost, well, maybe we'll have a different behavior. But this is not the business model of the internet today. Internet is free. Yeah. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion and it's a fascinating book, The Dark Cloud, The Hidden Costs of the Digital World. I can recommend all of our listeners to go and go and get a copy. And certainly, I think for the the energy and commodities world that this podcast is focused on, you know, where it is, the impacts are immediately visible and the the requirements, the constraints and so forth are, are right there. And if you ask me, I think it's also where much of the opportunity is to tackle greenhouse gas emissions and this is the industry to be in to do that it's a it's a, it's a welcome sort of reminder actually both in our daily lives as well as the, the technology sector you know actually this massive amount of impact that they are creating and it's it's sort of a you know it, this requires a not a whole of whole of government solution but a whole of planet solution to about how we are going to spend our limited resources and you know and as you, as you ended up there that will probably in the end require some changing habits and emphasis on how we consume data on the internet but it's been really good to have you back on Guillaume. thank you paul thank you again thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show please give us a positive review on apple podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.